General Congregation 16, 1997. General Congregation 15, 1992. Foresaw in Decree 10 the possibility of creating a lay movement with an international character. A few years later, the 1994 Intermediate Meeting saw the need to recognize the mission of laypeople in the Church and share with them our spirituality, forming ourselves to collaborate with them without superiority or undue power or protagonism. Congregation Roman 16 explicitly formulated these two desires that would be such a help to the Institute in the area of Evangelization Lady 3 and the document in Communion towards the Future 3, Closer Collaboration with the Laity. This general congregation asked that upon setting out the planning criteria at the general and provincial levels, we keep in mind, among other things, our ability to attend to the poverties of every reality from our tourism of reparation and renew our educational commitments in order to respond charismatically to new challenges. Laody. 3. The general congregation sees the need for the creation of the ACI family of lay people with an international character to integrate the groups born in our institute, respecting their identity and autonomy, and with common guidelines from our charism. Live reparation as a response of love to Christ who calls us to collaboration with him in the reconciliation of a broken world, a response from the Eucharist in its dimensions of celebration, adoration, attitudes. Know the figure of Saint Raphaela Maria and her spirituality. Carry out some activities which express an apostolic commitment especially with those on the margins of society, in order to be agents of social change. As members of the Church, discover the potential of their lay vocation and live it actively, in ecclesial initiatives as well as in the various surroundings of daily life. Maintain close and advisory relations with a handmade community. In communion towards the future, the process, in communion towards the future, lived by the whole Institute, has strengthened our sense of being one body, and has made us experience that the Spirit leads us by ways of communion. He encourages us to advance boldly and trustingly by these ways, in order to make Jesus Christ more present in our world, as our Lord and Savior. 3. Closer Collaboration with the Laity Within a Church of Communion and Participation, we have become aware that the various members can and should unite forces in a spirit of collaboration and interchange of gifts with the purpose of sharing more effectively in the Church's mission. We are working more and more with lay people in ministry at parochial and diocesan levels, as well as in our own apostolic works. The laity bring us the richness of their own vocation, an authentic gift which harmonizes with our religious vocation and complements it. Together we live out a common mission in the Church. We too are called to be a reciprocal gift to the laity, offered freely, with the desire of communicating to them what we are and what we have received, love of Christ in the Eucharist and the desire to collaborate with him in universal reconciliation. A serious effort at formation will help us to go more deeply into the sense of the different charisms in the Church, especially that of lay people, and will make it easier for us to walk with them in a new way, working together so that the world may be more human and more gospel-like. Saint Raphaela Mary desired her institute to be a united family, and now it opens its arms to all those who wish to share its spirit and mission. The ACI family will be a new expression of communion, of this walking together with lay people, and an invitation to share more intensely in the spirituality and the mission of the institute. 5. Criteria for Planning Planning at provincial and general levels is essential if we are to open our future to new horizons. On the path of communion along which we are traveling, we have seen that it would be appropriate to indicate some criteria to guide our planning and give it unity. These are profound convictions that arise from our way of being, and which point out where and how we should proceed. 5.1. The charism is a gift for the church and for the world. Our decisions have to urge us on to whatever most helps us to live it fully and joyfully. Five point four faithful to the preferential option for the poor. We wish to attend to the poverties of each reality, especially those which the world most neglects and where life is most threatened. 
5.5 A gaze of reparation at the world leads us to renew our commitment to education, responding to the challenges which require new forms of presence. 5.7 Recognizing the mission of the laity in the church we want to collaborate with them, as a sign of communion, which opens up new possibilities of evangelization. General Congregation 17 2002 In the same spirit of searching for the will of the Lord in the face of the new challenges of history that characterized our foundresses and thoroughly convinced that the reparative mission of the Institute is a response to humanity that is particularly valid in this moment of history, this general congregation, in addition to the introductory decree, the legislative decrees, and the recommendations to the superior general, made for, specific calls, having to do with our mission in order to show us where and how God is moving us forward. In the fourth, we are asked to be more creative in education in the service of the gospel. In this world of continuous change, it is essential to reflect, seriously and critically, on the currents of thought which influence it, and at the same time, to be attentive to the concrete situations of the men and women whom we evangelize and educate. The urgent demands of the reality in which we live today point to certain pastoral needs in our work of education in the service of the gospel, which we should bear in mind if we are to better collaborate in God's plan. We want to renew our commitment to ensuring that our apostolic action, in whatever place or work we may be, affects the lives of the poorest and those who are excluded and contributes to the transformation of unjust structures. Undertake pastoral work with families, with projects which promote the dignity of women, protect and educate children, offer a human and spiritual formation to fill the void caused by the absence of values, and foster reconciliation. Make of the family a space of growth for the human and Christian vocation. Commit ourselves to the education and formation of women, so that they can discover their own gifts and live their vocation in the world. Involve ourselves in accompanying young people who, though full of contradictions, are seeking that which will bring meaning into their lives. We want to help them to discover their own vocation in the world and in the church. Appendix 3. Letters and Conferences of Superiors General and Cicitor. Margarita Agorazabala. Letter of St. Raphaela Maria, 1887-1893 To Cardinal Simoni, Pontifical Secretary of State Madrid, April 22, 1877 This report is one of the oldest documents about the character and mission of the Institute. What appears here has been selected for its reference to education. Most Eminent Sir, On the occasion of directing myself to your eminence, I do so in the name of the 18 young women who are my companions, among whom there are sufficient financial resources in order to inform your eminence of the establishment of a new foundation of sisters in this township and jurisdiction of Madrid, under the authority of and dependent upon our most beloved Diosin prelate, as will be the case in the possible future foundation of communities in other areas. The Quiry Paratrices, in addition to perpetual adoration, the chanted office of the Sacred Heart, and on Saturdays, the office of the Immaculate Conception, and other prayers and divine praises, will dedicate themselves to the simple, but solid Catholic formation and free instruction of the poor girls of the town. Mary of the Sacred Heart, Superior of the Reparatrices, to Pierist Father Manuel Perez de la Madre de Dios, Madrid, October 23, 1881. The selected paragraphs from this letter of St. Raphaela Maria make manifest the esteem in which the saint held education from the very beginning. I am not discouraged by the obstacles which all good works have to face in their beginnings. On the contrary, it gives me comfort to see this marked from the very beginning with the divine seal, just like every good work of God. Our rules have been adapted from those of St. Ignatius of Loyola, as stated in the statutes, both for the spiritual and temporal government. These statutes have been revised and corrected by the nuncio, and were later definitively approved by His Eminence Cardinal Morno. Both of these competent persons as well as our auxiliary bishop considered it advisable to send the statutes in this reduced form. 
The statutes state the end of this work, the means at its disposal to sustain it, the work and the practices which have been adopted so as to attain this end, and which we have seen by experience we can carry out easily and prudently. Education does not hold a secondary place with us, far from it. This is seen by the fact that we have among our religious qualified and experienced teachers. These teach other religious who have sufficient ability. We have not as yet any large schools, because buildings are so expensive here. But God willing, we shall have them with time. We have them already in Cordoba. Unsigned it. To the Bishop of Vitoria, Bishop Mariano Miguel Gomez. Madrid, January 23, 1886. The fragment of the following document belongs to the copy which St. Rafaela Maria sent to the Bishop of Vitoria, asking to found the House of Bilbao, in which she wanted to offer free instruction. Most excellent and illustrious sir, the superior of the congregation of reparatrices of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, with the greatest consideration and respect to your illustrious excellency, declares that desiring the greater glory of God, in the degree possible, according to the end of her institute, by the alleviation of the offenses that are committed against the Sacred Heart of Jesus and seeking the good of souls, especially with adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, free teaching of poor girls, and retreats for ladies who wish to make the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, as expressed in the statutes of the congregation, is considering the founding of new communities in order to fulfill these ends, and most particularly, because the Holy See desires new foundations in order to give approbation to the said congregation. One of the locations where this writer would like to see a new foundation established would be in the capital of Vizca, the city of Bilbao, in the diocese of your illustrious excellency, which you so worthily direct, if your generous heart would find it pleasing to accept, because she believes that there would be, in every respect, an abundant harvest of fruit, especially in the area of free education. There are sufficient personnel and financial resources to sustain this activity, both in the goods of the congregation and the dowries of the sisters. To Mother Felisa de Jesus, Bilbao, Madrid, June 12, 1887. The letter which Saint Raphaela writes to this mother demonstrates the interest the saint shows in education. Even while recognizing the limitations of the girls, she considers them to be something of great price, for they have cost the blood of God himself. Although I am in a hurry, I am going to write you a few words as you wish. That sadness is from the devil and is the cause of your dryness and darkness. Inform yourself to the will of God, and peace and joy of spirit will come back to you. Don't be upset by these dislikes. It is natural that you should go through the state you are now in. As soon as you become joyful again, you will like everything, and you will look at the children specially, not as the inconsequent little beings which they are by nature, but with the interest with which one looks at something very precious, for each soul has cost the blood of God himself. Whatever you do for them, our Lord receives as done to him. Pray much for them to the Sacred Heart, and concern yourself about them as members of his body. I cannot write more now. I like to see you very courageous. An embrace from yours in Jesus. Mary of the Sacred Heart. Letter to Mother Maria del Pillar. 1893-1903. To her sister Madrid. Rome, March 30, 1886. In this letter, Mother Pillar shows herself to be interested exclusively in the teaching offered by the poor schools, and within this, most particularly in religious instruction. I reiterate that I am not needed for the correction of the constitutions, because I am convinced that the two of us want the same thing, namely, put into law that which we already practice. They only make the following suggestions. Fifth, they will also dedicate themselves to give poor girls who go regularly to their schools as day students an education suited to their class, giving their principal effort in religious education. This I would do, first of all, so that no prelate or other person insert anything else, for two reasons. First for the girls, who in the short time their mothers allow them to attend school, must be taught the essential, and secondly, because to give another sort of education would require more sisters, and I have personal experience of this. Your sister. 
Letter to her sister Madrid. La Coruña, April 3, 1888. Mother Pillar, after giving Saint Rafaela information about the city of La Coruña, suggests that there is a need to broaden the educational apostolic activity of the Institute. I think that a foundation here is like playing the lottery, because if it is true that there is, first of all, no religious interest among the women, and secondly, the population here is not at the level of other places, both difficulties could well be due to the fact there is no modern religious institute there is no celebration of the 40 hours, either, nor trains until recently. As far as the first problem, it could be that our presence in time, would bring a spiritual change, and in as far as the second one, the arrival of the railroad gives the city a growing importance and mobility, because the basics come through the port, and they tell me that it has not even been three years since the railway came here. Father tells me that what the ladies desire most strongly is education, and having access to it, even as day students, would be a great thing in every respect, because currently they are going to a place where it is taught that hell is only temporary and not eternal. Wouldn't it be possible for you to investigate, if, like I said, it seems to you all to be the right thing to found here, whether there would be some niche someplace which we could use for classes, broader and nicer than the ones for the poor girls, for these other, rich girls. I think I remember hearing father say that it wouldn't take much to content the people, that is to say, undertake a great deal. I am not explaining myself well, because as I've said, I cannot do otherwise, Consulting you is an act of conscience, and by making the classes broader I mean in terms of subjects offered, but the hours and everything else would be like that for the poor. And I think that truly, if this could be, we would give honor and glory to God through the good that would almost certainly be done for these souls that are so needy and without resources, and we could have this until others came along who could take over the work, as they will, and who knows, maybe this city, so cold and indifferent, might indeed be regenerated. Your sister. To Mother Maria del Salvador, Bilbao. La Coruña, April 5, 1888. Mother Pillar relates to Mother Maria del Salvador a need to found an academy for the well-to-do in La Coruña. She states as the reason the religious coldness and the lack of religious formation in this city. Here you have us so well cared for and connected with the fathers, at least as much here as there, as they show as much or more interest that we stay here as they did there that we go. But the thing is that they want the education of rich girls, and for me, well, I don't know if God has done it because of their prayers or because he really wants it, but God has changed me in such a way that I cannot think of anything else. Place this intention before God and have the sisters commend it to God, too, because I've written to Madrid, and it is essential that the decision be the fulfillment of this holy and beloved will. Imagine, neither here nor in the vicinity is there education offered by sisters, but rather municipal schools where they teach that hell is not eternal, but temporary. And in this way, without religion, although there are many ladies, you hardly see them in church, nor do they participate in anything good. And I say, why found here without forming these hearts in piety, without which there is no hope of their contributing to the upkeep of the house, nor of their even visiting the church, nor vocations, nor anything. My judgment is that unless we offer both a day academy and a poor school, which is the goal, we should leave, and it breaks my heart to not be able to remedy this need, for I think that if St. Ignatius were to live today and come here, and understand the great needs here, above all other deliberations yesterday a cleric told us about a woman who was upset because her mother told her to go to confession, responding that she had no sins, and when the priest asked her when the last time she had confessed, she answered, only two years, not knowing the obligation to confess every year. Look what crass ignorance there is here, seeing their hunger for education, he would bring priests here, even though there would be no hope for usefulness for the company, simply for the honor and glory of God and the good of souls, even if that should mean taking them away from places that supplied the company with all its success. Please do not think that this is inconsequential, La Coruña has 50,000 souls and many in the upper class. The town is very similar to Cadiz, and it shocks me that teaching institutes have not streamed here. 
Could it be that it is because it was reserved for us, since the most blessed sacrament is the patron of Galicia? Maria del Pilar To Mother Lucarda, La Coruña Sevilla, May 5, 1896 The Academy of La Coruña was opened as a boarding school on September 16, 1888. In this letter, Mother Pillar explains the reasons which move her to also desire a day school, which was indeed created in 1896. Hopefully it will be possible to open a day school, but without expanding the building, or it will not be as inexpensive as I'm afraid the people want. I will put forth the greatest effort in order to save that foundation, for two reasons that are dear to me, first of all because of the lack of Christian education in those lands, and secondly for the fathers. Also, since it has already been founded, I plan there is to go slowly, already slow myself down in all the houses, as you know, as much as I think is necessary. Here I do so because of the adverse circumstances that this foundation has, and I do my utmost because I would like to be there by the end of the school year, because it seems to me that it would be best, looking toward the glory of God, to persevere in finally overcoming the evils rather than running haphazardly from here to there. Maria del Pilar To Mother Presentacion Arola, Cadiz, Valladolid, July 6, 1897. With great acumen, S.R. Immaculata Yanez refers to this letter as the Magna Carta of our apostolic activity of education. In this letter, Mother Pillar encourages those dedicated to this task to sacrifice even your lives for the education of youth. My very dear Presentacion, it pleases me so much to receive a letter from you and if I could, to be able to write you and all the academies more often, because when I see how they value them, it impassions me to instill in you the desire to sacrifice even your lives for the education of youth. Truly, teaching was the distinct characteristic of the life of our Lord, because even in his hidden life we are told that its goal was to make him available as an example for us, since he did not have to strive for availability to God for this holy mission of teaching. And I can't put into words how my desire for teaching keeps growing, and it even comes to my mind that my sister and I left the Carmelettes in order to found a school in Cordoba, and in that we saw, then, the will of God. And it was so clear, that when Father Urwela met with the gentlemen who were directing us, and Father pointed out the French sisters, those gentlemen representing us asked that institute for a school. And when they did not fulfill the request, the split came about. At least that was the apparent reason, although there were others. And when I consider that the second guide that the Lord gave, Father Cotnilla, a he rest in peace, put academies, at all cost, in the little constitutions that he made for us, and how, despite the opposition to the academies, albeit with good intentions, they have remained those whom we wish to imitate, have no other way of life, I see it all outlined in the way of life of our Lord Jesus Christ, and this gives me increased fervor for them considering how completely we imitate our Master when we unite the adoration of Jesus exposed on the altar with teaching. And when the Institute has more personnel, you'll see how the Academies will beautifully elevate the worship of the Blessed Sacrament, because it will be alternating both goals, bringing to the throne the exhaustion and the compassion we feel for our little angels, and later, bringing to our classes and the care we show to the girls all the blessings and lights received in the royal audience. Finally I will sign off, there's just not time. I give preference in staffing to the academies except for a singer or organist that may be necessary for some house, but first of all, qualified personnel, even among men, are few, and secondly, the institute is young and our personnel is scarce. Let us suffer a little bit of want and do what we can, for the master will make up for it. This is faith. And for your consolation, those of you in the academy, Know that those who dedicate themselves to the academies are those who end up being the most useful for the congregation, for everyone. Embracing you, your sister. Maria del Pilar. To Mrs. Nieves Fabres de Sulis, de Sanche Tabernero. Valladolid, October 25, 1903. Mother Pilar had already stepped down as general by this time, but the apostolate of education, which she had worked so hard to secure, continued to engage and interest her, as we can observe in this letter. 
You don't know how much joy it gave me to hear the academy so valued. I'm of the belief that we should educate as best we can, very much from the heart, looking for God's glory. As far as the pleasure with which I received your eldest daughter, and thus it will be with all of them, this is demonstrated by my insistence from the beginning that you give us Salada. Now that we have the terrain, we have to beg God to help us to construct a great building with all the necessary facilities, that he may receive great glory in our educating holy and useful women who will sanctify society. Maria del Pilar Mother Cristina Estrada 1932-1965 For the Superiors of Academy Communities Rome, July 1, 1948 In this letter, Mother Cristina asks the superiors to have the sisters that work in the field of education make a reflection on their experience as educators in the light of what they know about their pupils. She recalls how important it is that the girls be formed in responsibility, and even more importantly, in Christian values, by personal attention to their needs. In the same way, union among them all is encouraged, and she shows her preoccupation and desire that the academies maintain quality in their instruction. I imagine as well that you will take advantage of this time in which the aforementioned mothers will have more time to meet occasionally so that you can address with them some things that should interest us all deeply, the moral and cultural formation of the girls confided to our care. These meetings will be very fruitful if they are preceded by each one making a serious reflection on the past, because the experience of successes, pitfalls, and difficulties is the best teacher in this profession of education. Undoubtedly, the experience which you all have, as well as the knowledge of the hearts of the girls whom you observe up close, will help you to perfect the methods already in place, which can always be improved. Nevertheless, even from here, I am aware of some things which have to do with the subject to which I refer, and perhaps I could say that I am in a position, O oh less privilege in its ability, to notice our efforts as a whole, judge their results, and observe something that I would like to bring to your attention, so that you may study it in these meetings and discover how to draw out its consequences and practical applications. It is good that in the area of discipline, a certain rigidity has been abandoned, a rigidity that, although it may have been useful in other times, is no longer so currently. However, perhaps in this we have gone too far, to the point of falling into the other extreme. We have to strive, indeed, that they acquire a deep inner sense of their own responsibility, first of all before God, and that they learn to act uprightly, not in order to gain human approval, but rather according to the dictates of their conscience. Yet all of this must happen without our neglecting to exercise our maternal vigilance over them, a care which does not oppress or stifle them, but which discreetly keeps them in our sight. Another aspect of education is intimately related to this. I note with approval that the alumni have very pleasant memories of their academies, and we should strive that this always be the case. There is no need for me to recommend that you instill in them deep piety, but as this is the base of our educational work, I don't know how to avoid telling you even in passing, since you already do this, that you must not be content with giving them an exterior piety, one centered on comportment in the chapel or even of regular attendance at religious acts, but rather that they may have intimate knowledge of their religion, that the love for Jesus Christ, the Blessed Virgin, the Holy Church, of all that forms the whole of our faith, be deeply rooted in their soul, and that they be so solidly grounded in the essential truths, that their convictions can later withstand not only outright attacks, but also the environment of frivolity, which is perhaps even more dangerous in the way it contributes to weakening one's beliefs. In order to accomplish this, religion classes do not suffice, even though we should give them the greatest importance, nor do the numerous occasions which present themselves and of which we should take advantage, with tact and sensitivity. Rather, it is important to cultivate each girl individually and attentively. This should be done at every age level, the little ones, because they are virgin territory where the first seed sown will be the one that is most deeply rooted, the girls in the middle grades because they are in the critical age in which their character is established and their passions are awakened, 
the older girls, because their eyes are opening to life and they encounter their first attractions and their first difficulties. In every age, then, it is necessary that they find a faithful heart with whom they can grow and a firm hand able to guide them. Another thing which is advisable to promote is the spirit of union and collaboration among all of ours who work in the academy. A good means for this is that the prefect, always, as I have already said, keeping in mind her authority, be very much in agreement with the prefect of studies, so that together they be the ones who report to the school families, since families value the academic advancement of their daughters so highly. Not only that, but it would be fitting that at some point the teachers themselves also do the same, personally and accompanied by the prefect, so that an interest is awakened in everyone for this cultural and educational work, tearing it forward with love and enthusiasm, not as someone who merely fulfills a duty. Without sufficient incentive, such action can end up being tiresome. And as is necessary, so that the academies prosper, maintaining themselves at the scientific level that is required today, we must put forth every effort to ensure that the teachers are correctly prepared, not only those who give high-level or official classes, but also those dedicated to the elementary courses, because families tend to lament the fact that this part of teaching is something we are less careful about. In order to avoid such an unfortunate judgment, I am trying to give greater emphasis to the studies ours undertake. Christina Estrada Asai to the Prefects and the Prefects of Studies of the Academies of Spain. Rome, February 24, 1950. Although the organization of our educational system was constantly improving, Mother Christina wants to figure out the source of some of the less satisfactory outcomes. She indicates, by way of orientation, some hints about what to correct, such as a good preparation for teachers and the application of solid pedagogical methods. I would like to spend some time with you to ascertain what is causing the results to be unsatisfactory, in order to apply the correct remedy. The mothers of the academies appear, in general, to be content with the way the older students are progressing with the secular teachers. However, the results achieved by the first-year students have not been good in some places. I do not think that this should be attributed principally to the first-year teachers, nor, as if it were unavoidable, to the disorientation of the girls as they go from the elementary to the middle school. It is true that upon passing from the grades in which they were taken care of by one mother, who besides teaching them lessons also guided them in studying and completing homework, to the upper grades in which the classes are given by several ladies who limit their teaching solely to class time, the girls must experience some degree of disorientation, if only temporarily. Nevertheless, I think that we have, to find another reason to explain why the girls have not benefited more by their studies. I have received many reports that lament the deficiencies in our teaching at the primary level. In my judgment, this is where the explanation lies for many difficulties that arise in the upper grades, and especially those that the students who are still small experience when they begin the upper grades. It is necessary that the teachers of these lower grade classes be empowered to carry out their mission. First of all, by possessing with complete mastery a level of knowledge beyond that which they have to transmit to their students. Secondly, by having a clear idea of the objective intended for their class, in conformity with the possibilities and needs of their learners. And thirdly, knowing, in theory and in practice, the means employed by modern pedagogy so that not only do the younger girls learn, but above all that they progress smoothly, developing their abilities, and at the same time, little by little, learning good study practices, that is, that they are taught a way to study that is useful and intelligent. In the grade immediately preceding the first year of the upper school, it is necessary to teach the girls to work and study independently, and to have them practice this. If, moreover, the teacher has mastery of the subject matter and a good method of teaching, she will have success in ensuring that her students know the curriculum well, which in many subjects is not so different from that of the first year of upper school. I think that girls, thus prepare, will be able to overcome with ease the difficulties that the transition from primary school to the middle school entails. In addition to the problem of primary education in the academies, about which I have already written, 
I have in mind are free schools, which require a prompt reorganization with a prepared teaching staff. I hope that in the Junorate, well organized, we may be able to offer our young mothers, besides a solid religious formation, the scientific, literary, and pedagogical formation that is now needed so that the schools and academies function well, but all of this requires time. You will do a work very pleasing to the Lord if, united with the two prefects, you manage to procure this formation for the mothers who are already in the academies. A very effective means to achieve this, and one I heartily recommend to you, is a subscription to good journals of pedagogy which you ought to read and ensure that the other mothers of the academy read them as well. The cooperation which I now desire of you in a special way, which I ask you for from the heart, and which I am sure you will offer with generosity, is that you expend every effort in overcoming difficulties, which I know exist, and that you help the superiors with the organization of middle schools in the academies, with the number of secular teachers needed to free up the mothers, whom we need to attend well to the needs of the free schools and in primary education in those same academies. I hope that with each and every one of us contributing, in the measure that she is able, to the fulfillment of what the general congregation has so wisely proposed, that the Lord will be pleased and will bless our sacrifices, making them fruitful, to the benefit of these girls whom he has entrusted to our care. Christina Estrada, Asai. To the mothers, teachers of the Academies of Spain. Rome, August 22, 1950. General Congregation 8, held in May of 1949 set the maximum number of hours of class and monitoring which together could be demanded of academy teachers. Mother Christina indicates the reasons for this decision, to avoid excessive work and to allow sufficient time for teachers to prepare themselves for their ministry. Two primary objectives are proposed by the congregation when it establishes this limit to the responsibilities you, mothers who teach, can be assigned in the academies. The first is this, to avoid an excess of work. This ordinarily impacts health negatively, especially the nervous system, such that even though we may think that with ceaseless and hurried activity we accomplish more, the reality is that in many cases this improved performance is more apparent than real. This is indeed verifiable once a few years have passed. Furthermore, it is clearly demonstrated that by working in this way, our natures, even for those of us who are strong, exhaust themselves in a short time and the number of years they are able to contribute to the works of the Institute are greatly reduced. Moreover, excessive activity is overwhelming, and this has an effect on the spirit, doing it harm. The second objective that the congregation is trying to achieve, following the repeated calls by the sacred congregation for seminaries and universities even in these past few years to the superiors of female religious congregations that teach, is to raise the level of our teaching, to accomplish this, it is necessary that the available time left to you outside of your classes and supervision of students be employed in becoming more and more competent for your mission as educators and teachers, and in long and short-range class planning. It is clear that preparation must consist in broadening and deepening the subject matter of courses that you teach, and in reflecting upon each of your classes and each student, upon how each one makes use of her education, and upon the means that might be appropriate to improve all of the aforementioned. However, it is no less evident, and this is what I would like for you all to keep in mind and use as a basis for action, that for all teachers, it is very useful and even essential to read pedagogical texts, those dealing with educational topics related to the courses you teach, and those that deal with educational topics in general. The preparation I have described to you requires a great deal of work, and it would be desirable that you devote even more time to it. However, I trust that, if you take careful advantage of all that is available, we will soon notice an improvement in the intellectual level of our academies, which must lead to great glory to the heart of Jesus. Christina Estrada